Okay, so the, the next speaker is Robert Kratky, and he, he will talk about uh, how to improve documentation. Hello, everyone. Thanks for your interest in this topic. I apologize for the technical difficulties. It wouldn't be a conference without any of those. Anyway, the topic of this uh, presentation is bridging the gap between legacy documentation and modular content. And what I mean by that is basically two aspects of uh, documentation that technical writers at Red Hat uh, are trying to solve. That is the user experience with documentation. At the same time, the amount of work, the maintenance work that documentation writers have to do. So first I would like to outline what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Uh, I will try to provide an introduction about why we even do that. What do you, why do we think that it's time to rethink that the way we do documentation? I will also talk about the terminology, what's in the title of the presentation, what I understand when I say legacy documentation and what I mean by modular content. I will then outline what we think is the problem with this so-called legacy documentation. I will try to explain why I even think that there's actually too much of the documentation. And uh, I will explain why it is hard to find and how, well, how we hope to fix that. And in the main part of the presentation, I will try to introduce what we think could be a solution to one of those problems and to all of those problems that I mentioned. First of all, we will try to cut down on the amount of content that we actually maintain and that the documentation entails by documenting only what the users really need to, really need to have documented. We will also talk about how to facilitate single sourcing of the documentation so that we can bring upstream and downstream closer together. And in the main part, what is modular documentation? And, uh, how do, we achieve, how do you hope to achieve uh, all of the above by switching to a modular form of documentation? Last but not least, I would like to, at the end, save some time to invite your questions and to have a discussion about what your experience with documentation is and uh, what, your, what your project or your organization does in this area and uh, if you're facing similar problems and so on. So let's get started, shall we? About the introduction, uh, first of all, the question is why. Why we think that it is high time that we rethought the way we do documentation. I like to point out two, two main aspects of that. I like to illustrate that on two, two problems or two areas uh, in which the software landscape is changing. And that is software packaging and software delivery. We've been for a long time used to these big monolithic mostly distributions where there would be hundreds or even thousands of packages. They would be sitting in repositories or you would get a CD or a DVD. You would install the thing and then you would have to kind of sort through it and find the stuff that you know, really matters for you. If you were concerned about performance or security, then you would have to you know, cut down on that. You would you know, get rid of all the stuff that you don't really need. And uh, that is changing. You know, not that you know, all applications would be containerized now, but that is definitely a big part of how applications are being deployed and how they are being packaged. And there are other ways to package applications that are not the same as they used to be. And the documentation needs to reflect that. We need to try to make the documentation work with those new scenarios as well. With regard to software delivery, again, we've been used to more or less regular release cycles. It could be that the distribution or a piece of software or project would have a release every six months, every 12 months, or even if the cadence of the release would not be in any way regular, it would still follow the sort of a traditional versioning scheme, like, you know, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, then there would be 
And the documentation tended to follow that. There would be a release of documentation, you know, for the 2.0 version, and then, then there would be another release of documentation. But then there came rolling updates, and nowadays there are web applications that are being deployed multiple times a day. And the sort of documentation that is tied to these release cycles is not exactly covering that. It, it doesn't really cut it for these scenarios. It should be the way the documentation is released and presented a lot more fluid, flexible. And about the terminology. By legacy documentation, I mean the sort of documentation that I touched upon with those releases, the documentation that is tied to individual releases. It's those big guides or books, and they tend to be comprehensive and complete. While there's nothing wrong with that, it tends to also create a whole lot of amount of documentation. And they're based on features. They describe every individual feature that the project or software has that can be used. And uh, as I said, it's important to emphasize that there's nothing inherently wrong with that sort of approach. And in an ideal world, you would have that as well as other types of documentation. But in a world where you have to choose where we spend our resources, it might be time to look for something else. Where modular documentation comes into picture. And that documentation differs from the sort of guide-like documentation in that it's based on individual user stories. So it doesn't strive for comprehensiveness. It doesn't even try to be complete. Instead, it tries to be highly targeted. It goes after specific goals. And it's in concise, independent, standalone, self-sufficient units of content that can be grouped and regrouped in order to achieve uh, documentation that describes describe specific purposes, that goes after specific goals. Now, I would like to illustrate the difference between feature-based documentation and documentation that is based on user stories on a simple example. On the left here, there is a silly example of a feature-based documentation. It tries to describe all the features. It tries to be comprehensive. I'm going to give you a second to read through that. Now, are we good? Let's compare that with the example on the right. This one is based on a specific user story. And it tries to describe how to take the user from A to B. It's about a specific goal. It's about accomplishing a concrete task. Again, take a second to read through that. Now, when you're looking at those two sides, those two examples, as I said before, it's important to recognize that there is nothing wrong with the one on the left. It's feature-based documentation is a sort of reference kind of guide. And it has its uses. However, for many users, unless they are really well-versed in this sort of project or features or distribution, for those users to find their way around this sort of documentation, they need to be experienced. They need to have a lot of time on their hands. And it doesn't make it very easy for them to to use this documentation to accomplish specific tasks. So as I said, in an ideal world, we would have both. We would have the one on the right that would guide the users when they need to solve a specific problem and when they need it to be done yesterday. Then, of course, we would also have the one on the left that would be there to describe the stuff as it happens, how the system functions, what the background is, how the features are laid out. So as I will talk about it in the later part of the presentation, we try to facilitate a scenario where the one on the right takes the user from A to B, but at the same time, the sort of modular documentation that we create would allow the user to experience the same, of it, the same sort of experience that they have with the example on the, on the left. And by the way, as I included down there, when I talk about user stories, I tend to take the sort of a standard agile-like template 
meaning I'm a sort of a user. I want to accomplish something so that I have some sort of an outcome. Are there any questions at this point before I go any further? OK, hey, cool. Now, let me try to describe what the problems are, the main, the main aspects of the problems with the legacy documentation. The sort of documentation that is based on features and that is compiled in those big, large books or guides. Now, in that first bullet, there's a sort of a cliche that nobody likes to write docs. Well, it's not really true that nobody likes to write docs. The problem is when there's too much of that, when the content accumulates over time where you have multiple versions and then you have to maintain documentation for that version and another version, and over time there's just too much of it. It becomes very difficult to maintain. And nobody's really excited about maintaining stuff that's, you know, that has been valid three or four years ago. And it's still valid for certain users who still have that deployed somewhere. But when there's a new contributor, they usually want to work on something new. That's, they want to describe stuff that they know about. They want to describe how to, how to perform a specific task. So there comes the cliche. Nobody likes to write docs because it has become tedious to maintain those guides. And it also invites a lot of duplication because uh, you know, there are different sets of docs for different versions. And uh, the content tends to be used, reused, but not really nicely. And if it's updated in the new one, it tends to be overlooked in the old one. Anyway, it leads to documentation that tends to become obsolete. And that's a problem. Secondly, the documentation is hard to find. And by that, I don't mean that it would be hard to Google for a documentation and you wouldn't find you know, for example, in Fedora, we have an administration guide. We have an installation guide, a security guide, a networking guide. But when there is a user who wants to, you know, configure SSH to be able to securely connect, connect to a remote server, what do they use? Well, they probably need to find something in the installation guide as well as in the security guide. It's about security after all. It's also about networking, so they will have to find something in the networking guide and the system administration guide. Well, there's probably gonna be a little bit of that as well. In reality, they would need to sort of cherry pick pieces out of all of those guides. And while it's possible, it's certainly not exactly user friendly. And it takes to take a lot of time and the user needs to be familiar with what's inside all of those guides. Well, oops. so what they do? Well, they Google it they end up going to somewhere as a Stack Overflow or something like that. And while there's nothing wrong with finding your answer at Stack Overflow, it tends to indicate that there is actually some deficiency with your documentation. Because the user, instead of being able to find the documentation that you have produced, well, they try to find it somewhere else. Lastly, the documentation is very hard to navigate because those guides tend to be very long and while it's useful for, you know, control F searching, it's definitely not useful for navigation. There's no hierarchy usually. And the experience is very hard to customize because when you take those guides and you want to save them, for example, for offline use, well, you get a humongous PDF or a huge pile of HTMLs that you have to browse. You cannot really find and take only the stuff that you want. So, well, of course, it leads to people saying this, which may or may not be true, but we're not exactly happy about that. Any questions? Cool, well, let's go forward. About how we would like to go about solving these problems. Well, we recognize that our solution is not the one fits all size, but we tend to think from experimentation and from conversation with support people and with the communities that it could be a way to go forward. So first of all, we would really like to concentrate on the stuff that the users really need. And in order to do that, in order to be able to cut down on the amount of content to ease the maintenance burden, we need to identify user stories 
that are really valid for users. We need to work with the community, we need to work with the engineers, we need to work with support organizations and find the user stories that the users really are interested in and that tend to solve the majority of the problems or not the majority of problems but the most common problems for the majority of the users. And by that, we should be able to achieve a more efficient use of our resources. That doesn't mean that there still wouldn't be some sort of a maintenance burden, but by trying to cut down on the amount of content and by communicating with the users about the user stories that they're really interested in, we are able to slowly reduce the amount of maintenance work. Also, when we try to bring upstream and downstream closer together and even single source the documentation than upstream and downstream users, we not only save time by avoiding duplication and not only duplication of content but of effort, but we're also able to bring new contributors on board because it just becomes easier. Upstream may not be at all concerned about how the project or software is being productized by company or some other project, but when they have the possibility to contribute to a single source repository, it's a very good thing. It also helps to bring the developers on board. Now there's another cliche that developers don't like to write documentation. And of course, some of them, they like coding better and they tend to think as documentation as something inferior, but that's definitely not across the board. And when we make it easier for them to contribute to the documentation, it becomes a whole new different story. And lastly, about the module of authoring and presentation of the documentation. This is basically the method that we're using to achieve all of the above. Now, I will talk in the next series of slides about what the modules and assemblies that I have here listed, the main components of our modular documentation, what they are, how they're formed, and so on. But first, I want to touch, up, touch upon the second bullet about the so-called curated assemblies and ad hoc docs. Now, by that I mean, and as I'm going to explain a little while later, an assembly, in our terminology, would be a realization of a user story. When there exists a user story, it has been identified, has been validated. We know what the user wants to achieve. We write, form, adopt some modules, and we assemble them, we collect them, combine them in a so-called assembly, and that becomes a description of the user story, a realization in documentation of the user story. And of course, such assemblies that are based on user stories that have been properly identified and validated, they could be called curated because we've put a lot of effort in them and we've made sure that they make sense. However, we recognize that we're not ever going to be able to identify all of those user stories. There's always going to be, you know, the guy who wants to install his Linux distribution on his internet-enabled refrigerator and use it to drive his home cinema or something like that. You know, it's unpredictable. So we recognize that. And we also want to allow these users to experience the sort of stuff, the sort of experience that they would have the, with the reference documentation, with the one that's based on features. So we try to come up with a really solid system of metadata that would be assigned to the individual parts of the modular documentation. And we would allow the user to browse through the entire body of the documentation that we have based on this metadata. It becomes highly hierarchical and it becomes possible to select the bits and pieces <coughs> of the documentation that pertains to the particular problem that the user is trying to solve or the particular area that they're interested in. So I choose here to call it ad hoc. What this allows us to have the presentation of the docs dynamic. It's not static anymore. It's not one huge page or guide. It becomes possible for a user 
to dynamically select the kind of stuff that they are that they are interested in and go away with that and use them. Again, questions? Cool. Let's describe those assemblies and modules. These are really the main components of what we call modular documentation. As I said before, I touched upon shortly, when we have a user story and we want to document it, we think about that realization of a user story as an assembly. It's a whole bunch of modules and other stuff that is being put together, combined in a coherent way to form an assembly. Now, I have a short node here that we purposefully avoid the word topic, even though many people say topic-based documentation and stuff like that. But we have found that it's, it's too loaded. The word is just too ambiguous. Everybody thinks that topic is somewhere, something else. So we just, that's the reason why we're not using it. Anyway, so we have an assembly and we have to populate it. So we have some sort of an introduction that should have a title, that should explain the purpose, what is going to be accomplished by following that piece of documentation. Might also have a list of prerequisites, some sort of conditions or steps that need to be taken before the user goes and follows this piece of documentation. The title should be very specific. It should be oriented towards a specific task, action oriented, such as, as was before, making an omelet, something like that. It would then be followed by the first module. It could be a conceptual module. It doesn't have to be there. And as an example I've chosen here, understanding the importance of omelets in French cuisine. Now you know that it's not really important or perhaps it's not necessary to understand this kind of stuff to be able to flip an omelet. But there are many scenarios where it may be very useful for the user to know the background. And by being able to include these conceptual modules into our assemblies, we're also recognizing the importance of the sort of feature-based documentation that we're supplanting, not really doing away with. And if we would combine only the conceptual modules, we would end up with something similar that we had before. So we don't want to discard that. We want to keep it in case it's necessary to have it. Then there would be an explanation of the, of the concept, of the background. And there could be a list of links to additional resources. Then would come the real meat of the of that piece of documentation. One or more procedural modules. They would have, again, action-oriented titles. They would describe steps that need to be taken to accomplish a certain task. And as I said, there could be one, there could be a bunch of them. It really depends on how granular is that particular assembly. How <coughs> wide was the user story when we have started with it. The steps in that module should be very explicit. They should be commands. They should say edit, open, copy, something like that. So that the user is clear on what is being asked of them. And again, each of those modules could have additional resources. Same as the assembly as a whole points to other pieces of documentation, related modules, related assemblies, related onion recipes, stuff like that. Now you may notice that the structure of that template for the assembly is basically the same as the template for the module. That is intentional. Those individual pieces of the documentation are all designed and written or adopted from existing documentation to be self-standing. It's necessary to have those modules in a way that they can be combined and recombined in different assemblies. Those individual partial steps may be used in very many different scenarios, many different user stories. So that is the reason why we're providing a sort of a rigid, but at the same time flexible in what the content might be template for these components. Questions? Um. <clears throat>
I'm sorry, could, could you use the microphone, please? How, how to cope with uh, a great number of uh, assemblies that uh, uh, came out uh, in, uh, in the project history? So sure. if, if a, with legacy doc, uh, we have uh, big manuals. I, I guess with uh, this approach, we will end with uh, having a great number of uh, these documents. And, uh, so you're asking how to organize the assemblies that we're going to end up and, with. And, and, uh, and maintain. And maintain them. Yes, uh, that's a very valid question. I actually had that included in, in one of the latest slides about the discussion. That's uh, something that we have to apply uh, a lot of planning for. We uh, try to come up with content strategy that would allow us to keep organizing this. We have explored many different uh, ways to keep track of what user stories are being put together, what assemblies are being uh, populated in order to describe these user stories so that we don't lose track on, you know, let's say that we would have a whole bunch of assemblies for beginners, but we would be lacking the more advanced stuff, or we would have user stories that would be identified for a specific area, but we would be lacking some other ones. So what we have come up with uh, is uh, for different products or different projects uh, that we're documenting, uh, mind maps that would allow us to keep a visual overview of uh, what we have available, what is missing, and uh, what, still needs, what still needs to be done, and how it all relates together, so that we, we don't have an overly documented one part of a project and then big gaps in another part. Thank you. I have a really short, quick question. You're, you're doing this in DocBook? In the formats that you're using for, for, um, for structuring your documentation, is that DocBook that you're using or? Yeah, so the question is whether you're using DocBook or yeah. a different format? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm a technical writer at Red Hat, and at this point, uh, most, the majority of our both upstream and downstream documentation is either in ASCII.org or in oh, DocBook. So we're sort of in the middle of a transition from DocBook to ASCII-Doc. Uh, but uh, we have these templates uh, in all of the formats that we're using for, you know, in, or in order to be accommodate, in order to be able to accommodate all the different writers who, who want to work with them. There was... Other questions? No. Okay. Cool. So let, let me wrap this up. We're going from legacy to modular. Now, as I said before, by legacy, I mean the kind of stuff that is based on features, that is included in big, long guides, and that tends to be complete, that goes after comprehensiveness. As I said before, nothing really wrong with that, but we want to sort of reposition the documentation into stuff that is being based on user stories that describes specific tasks that is action oriented and that is based on this modular approach. As I said before, the modular approach luckily allows us to let the user have the same sort of experience, or not the same, but a very similar one as with the feature based documentation when we make rich use of the metadata that we apply to the individual modules. Secondly, this allows us, by identifying the user stories that we really want to use, that the users are really interested in, to reduce the amount of content, to ease the maintenance burden of the, of the documentation writers, and also to attract new contributors because the learning curve is not too steep for them when the documentation is in these modular pieces because it's very hard for a person who comes and is new either in an open source project or in an organization to start contributing to documentation 
But it's all about those big guides, and it's, you know, you you're get a system administration guide dump on your lab, and you have to first read it so that you know what's in there. You have to become familiar with that. It's very daunting. When you present people with the opportunity to actually document short user stories, the kind of stuff that they're already familiar with. They have figured something out, now they want to share with, share with others. So they can document, they can provide a procedure that would become a module, they can provide a bunch of modules, they can even populate an entire assembly slash user story. So not only are we cutting, cutting down on the amount of content, we're also making it easier for people to pick the pieces that they want to document and start right away. And thirdly, we're trying to improve the experience for the end user by making it easier to navigate the documentation and by taking it from static documentation into dynamic presentation. And that is being accomplished by heavy use of metadata which allows us to present the documentation in a highly hierarchical way, starting from the top where it's not really granular, going down through a hierarchical structure based on the dynamic presentation of the metadata-based documentation. Yes, uh, could some, there are two questions there, could you please? I think before you get on to maybe the more technical side, the thing that I've been trying this technique a little bit myself and the thing that bothers me slightly and maybe the next talk is going to go into a bit, it's a bit more, is how to keep things modular and but still maintain a kind of consistent storytelling narrative that doesn't just sound a bit disjointed with steps that sound like they were written by different people or in different styles and just maintaining that a document still sounds like a cohesive whole, I suppose. Right, so the question is, how we go about making the module documentation still coherent, still that, so that the different pieces are not disjointed, that still sound like something that a user would like to read? Do I understand it correctly? Well, so as I mentioned before, when I talked about the so-called curated assemblies, those are the ones that we focus on when we put together the individual user stories. And uh, in between the different parts of the assembly, the different modules, the introduction, and perhaps the conclusion where there are links to additional references, we are not against including, you know, sort of stuff that I could call, you know, fluff or uh, stuff that you bridge you over from one module to another. The kind of stuff that would make it easier to read. Now, those would be the curated assemblies. Those would be the one that we spend time on. At the same time, as I said, it's not possible always to be sure or to identify or to document all the user stories that the, that the users would really need. So it may, it may be that there is a certain topic or an area that people are interested in which we haven't covered in this curated assembly that is easy and nicely read. So then it would be with the understanding that the individual pieces are being compiled in an ad hoc dynamic manner. And then of course there wouldn't be the nice experience that we offer with the curated assemblies. But as I said, we try to work very hard to identify and validate the user stories uh, that we put effort into so that the experience would be nice for the user. So we are, we're definitely talking about um, uh, documentation in times of continuous delivery processes and something like that. Uh, what's your recommendation? Where should I maintain such kind of modular documentation? Is it alongside the, the source code as just another piece of the source code in the same repository or something like that? So the question is where to maintain this sort of modular documentation, whether it would be in the same repo as the project code or somewhere else? Well, this really depends on what sort of a project or community it would be a part of. Uh, we have uh, 
no strict rules or you know guidelines about that. Uh, we are part of uh, many different numbers of communities, and we don't really want to impose on them some uh, template or uh, uh, rigid uh, structure that they would need to follow. We try to accommodate uh, the uh, the request of the community. That said, what we try to encourage. Uh, all, all communities or projects that we're involved in is to uh, use a specific structure of a repository for, uh, we're using Git for those repositories, of a repository that makes it very easy to combine and reuse the content. And we have uh, this structure which uh, we have uh, freely available for anyone to use that uh, can be included either as a separate repository if that's the preference of the project or that can, be, uh, that can be a part of a larger repository that includes also code or other artifacts. So it's very flexible and it really depends on what is the common ground, what is the understanding in a particular project. It has so far worked very nicely for us in both ways, both uh, separate repository for documentation and a repository that includes both code and docs. Uh, okay, just <coughs> one thing, because uh, I, it's not clear. When, when you say dynamic, in the dynamic presentation, you, when you create a user story, uh, you, this is composed by several parts, but these parts are made the only for that user story or are still part of uh, small sub pieces because I was just wondering if uh, I could create my own user story using these sub pieces like picking up sm smaller amounts that you use of information that you use to create your user stories and, and making that because if the user story that I'm looking for is not existing can I make it up or not well, if I understand it correctly, the question is whether you can come up with your own user story that is not part of what we have been documenting. Is that correct? Well, of course, yes. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we try to encourage documentation writers not to rely on themselves only when identifying the individual user stories. Because they, as documentation writers, might have very different ideas about what is, being, what is necessary to describe as a part of documentation as opposed to what the users really need. So we always try to encourage collaboration in, on all the different levels and trying to involve as many people as possible in identifying those user stories. That said, if there is a user who you know, has a specific use case or has a specific task that needs to be accomplished, and uh, so they identify a user story for themselves, and then they want that user story do, to be documented. We either accept that as a, you know, a bug or an enhancement that needs to be done, or we invite the user to be the one to, you know, start with the documentation and uh, and document that user story. Is, does that answer the question? Sure. I've, um, it's a bit of a plug. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're working on an open source uh, Drupal uh, distribution for doing modular content. It allows you to pull um, like topics or, <laughs> or, <laughs> or modules or however you want to call them uh, from different repositories and then compile them into one single uh, website that, that publishes your documentation so that you could combine documentation from different projects. If there's anybody in the room who, who would need a system like that, um, just come and see me. Any other question? Well, I, I do have a remark, well, a question, sort of. Uh, I think that some, some, something that is uh, hard with the modular approach is to be able to oversee all the modules and how they can be re reused. So if, if you have uh, one um, user story, I agree that it, it's much easier to, to, to change it some way, and, uh, but the, the, there is a new role, which is assembling 
all in, in assembly, all those modules, and, and having an idea of what should be specific, what should be generic, and, and I think that that's a, a very, um, th th that's a role that really needs to have an overview of uh, even more, uh, even wider overview than in the legacy uh, documentation. Do you have uh, something to say about that? So the question is where, how we track where the different pieces of the model documentation are being used, basically? Yeah, and, and also in, how, how, to, how, how to have an idea of what needs to be done and what can be reused. Opposed. I, I don't know, people start with their own story, so they do their own modules, and then it, it's nice if uh, some can be uh, uh, brought together because they are similar. Maybe yes. they just need some, some, some little stuff to be different at the beginning. Then. And overseeing all that kind of process, that seems to be quite hard to, to do and really need a uh, very big overview of uh, right. a lot of yeah. things. So, I understand. So two levels of, a, of an answer to that question. First, as I mentioned before, we use uh, mind mapping software to keep track of uh, the different parts of uh, uh, the project or the aspects of uh, what needs to be documented to, to keep track of what we have already documented and what needs to be still done. But at the same time, as I mentioned, the metadata-based hierarchical presentation of the documentation allows us to very easily filter for, what, uh, for different pieces of documentation that we already have. So for example, if you, you know, you're interested in security documentation, it's very easy for us to filter all the pieces of documentation that we already have that touches upon security. And you can go deeper, more granular. The deeper you go, the you know, narrower the selection is going to be, but it allows you to very easily see in what sort of documentation already exists in what areas. So that when somebody wants to document a user story, they first go through the available body of documentation and they see whether some of the procedures or tasks have already been described and whether they can reuse them so that they wouldn't you know, do it over again. And uh, as I said, the hierarchical structure makes it uh, quite convenient to, to browse through that documentation, even though uh, it starts out as a very large body of documentation, you can easily get down to what you're really interested in. Hi, um, you mentioned moving from uh, DocBook to ASCII doc. Um, did you consider also, uh, I like ASCII doc, I do like it, but did you also consider Markdown? Is it too simple or just not a fully feature? So the question is whether we also consider Markdown as a format for documentation. And yes, we do. Some of the communities that we, uh, that we work with uh, do use Markdown for various, research, uh, for various reasons, for example, uh, I have now been trying to figure out a way to, to work with Markdown in combination with ASCII doc because uh, the Go language uh, has many different tools that uh, allow the automatic generation of Markdown reference documentation and we, we need to find ways to sort of make that work together with uh, other parts of ASCII doc documentation. So there's nothing really, you know, that would uh, that we would have against Markdown. It's just that ASCII doc provides us with uh, more options. It's more flexible. It's a little bit more complicated, but uh, it's still very easy to learn. The markup of, the, of ASCII doc is, is uh, uh, quite simple to learn. So it's, it was just a conscious choice to go with ASCII doc because uh, the tooling around ASCII doc, such as ASCII binder and other pieces of software, are very convenient and allow us to do a lot of things with it. What sort of tooling do you use, like uh, with uh, ASCII Doctor? Or? So for ASCII Doctor, we mostly uh, for rendering we mostly use ASCII Doctor. As I mentioned, we also use ASCII Binder in different projects uh, to actually uh, present uh, the documentation on websites, and then we have. Uh, um, many different uh, in-house tools that are you know, out in the open on GitHub and stuff, and that solve different problems uh, and uh, provide different templates for, for individual pieces of documentation. 
I can uh, go into details if you're interested uh, afterwards, I would, I would suggest. Can we have just one more, I think, perhaps? Excuse me? Another question. Do we have time? I haven't heard the last. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. Just, uh, can you speak a little bit more about more uh, media sort of video? Do you, do you see that? Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think that the majority of the users are like a beginners or entry level, so they like rather watch videos than read complex documentation. And even if you do your modular approach and you synthesize a very small amount of information in one module, they still tend to go and see a video. So how do you counter I, I apologize, I'm really having a hard time to understand. Could you try to speak up, please? I, I, I thought that you hear well. Um, so my question was, how do you uh, approach video or some sort of a motion, other way of expressing a, uh, documentation? Because these days users, uh, despite your modular approach, I think that they tend to go to uh, look into videos instead of reading documentation. So are you asking how we work with uh, oh, videos? OK, um, so I, I believe that's a, that's a whole larger question which we probably don't have much time for at this moment. But I'm really happy to discuss, discuss that with you. We have, uh, uh, in several projects, encountered that problem. And we have worked with videos within ASCII-Doc with uh, mixed success. But uh, I'd be happy to talk about that more. Actually, my last slide was just a couple of points for suggestions for discussion, which we have gone through. I'm afraid we are out of time at this point. So if there are any more questions, uh, please feel, feel free to find me down here. I'd be happy to discuss. Thanks for your attention.